professor of physics at Williams and this is the first in the two lecture series the physics of musical sound this material is something that's been interesting to me for pretty much my whole life I've always loved science and I'm a terrible musician but I love to listen to music you'll notice a little bit of a prejudice towards string instruments in this talk but I'll try to give credit to a few other kinds of instruments as well I've always cared about this material like I said but I had a chance to learn a lot more about it when I developed a course with Tiku Majumdar about a decade ago on the science of musical sound. So I'm going to tell you a few things that come from that course and that's a course that's designed for students who have no background in music or physics necessarily so I hope that the ideas will be able to come across, across clearly to people with a huge variety of different experiences. So the first question we should find out about is what is a sound? So a sound is a wave that moves through air. So my voice is coming to you right now by shaking the air. To think about that, we should start by thinking about what a wave is. So a wave is some kind of a disturbance. I'm going to create a wave for you right now on this long machine. And to create a wave, you somehow have to take something that's resting at equilibrium and disturb it. So let's disturb this guy. So you'll notice that as I disturb this machine, there's something that moves from the bottom where I'm shaking it up to the top and then comes back. But the thing that moves is not the individual particles. This bottom rod doesn't pick up and fly up to the top, right? It's the disturbance itself that's moving up and down. And that's the characteristic of a wave. It's a disturbance that moves, but the individual pieces of stuff just move back and forth in place. So this is one kind of a wave. Um, a couple of things that we should note about waves. So the disturbance moves the individual particles slosh or oscillate back and forth in place. The disturbance is able to move because the individual pieces are somehow connected or coupled together. So here I've got this stiff piece of metal that connects each of these rods. And that means that if I move one of them, that twisting gets transmitted up to the next one and shakes the next guy, and it shakes the next guy, and it shakes the next guy as well. So the speed with which the disturbance moves has to do with both how strongly the individual pieces are coupled, so how stiff this piece of metal is, the stiffer it is, the faster the wave would move. Another wave that you might be used to thinking about would be like a wave on a string. Shake a string up and down, a wave moves along it. The speed with which that wave is transmitted has to do with how tightly you've pulled the string, how high the tension is in the string. You can slow the wave down by making the stuff heavier. So if I made each of these guys really heavy, put a big mass on the end of each one, when I shake this, the wave will go much more slowly because it's harder to move those heavy objects. Okay? Um, another thing to think about <coughs> is how do we translate this idea with the sticks that connect to a sound wave in the room? So a sound wave, what's disturbing in a sound wave? A sound wave is a disturbance of the air. So an easy way to think about this is to make the simplest sound I know how. Okay, let's clap. What am I doing? I'm taking my hands and I'm squashing the air up. And if you can imagine all the air molecules in here, I've actually squished them together so there's a compression. There's a region of the air that's no longer at rest, no longer in equilibrium like this, but actually disturbed because I've taken it to a higher density. And that moves out to you and eventually it shakes your ears. Let's see if we can see that happening. Okay, so this is sort of a visual of what a sound wave would be. It's a little region of compressed air. And we can see what we have one by measuring it, for example, on a microphone. So you can see as I'm talking here that there's some sort of wiggles happening on this screen. 
What is this screen? So what this is, is the signal coming out of the microphone. And what you want to imagine is a little compressed region of air coming up to the microphone and actually pushing physically on a little membrane. And that motion of the membrane is translated into what you see on the screen. So here's me clapping. And you can imagine the compressed air coming up and pushing. And then you see the signal on the screen. So what allows a sound wave in air to travel from one place to another. Certainly we don't have metal sticks connecting each of the molecules in the air, allowing them to push on one another. But the molecules do move freely, and so when I get some of them moving faster, if I squash them, they run into one another, and it's that collision between the air molecules that allows the wave to move from one place to the next. So that means actually that the speed with which sound propagates from one place to another depends on the properties of the air. So you might have seen somebody playing with helium. Have you guys ever seen someone breathe in helium and then their voice changes and it gets all high and squeaky? That's because when you replace regular air with helium, the air gets lighter. And we know that whenever you make something lighter, the wave or the disturbance can propagate more quickly. So the speed of sound in helium is faster than the speed of sound in air. That's how your voice gets squeaky if you play with helium. You might also know, particularly if you play a wind instrument, that the pitch of the instrument gets messed up if you've been keeping it outside in the cold and then you bring it inside to play. Again, that's because the temperature of the air affects the speed of sound, because that affects the density of the air, and that affects how easily one molecule can run into the next. So for our purposes, we'll mostly be thinking about sound waves in room temperature air, and those go about 340 meters per second. So when I clap, that compression moves out to you, and in one second, it gets about 300 meters. Okay. Now for musical sounds, we're most interested not in waves or disturbances that just happen once, like that clap where I just create one compression in the air. We're more interested in waves that happen repetitively, over and over again, repeating the same series of compressions. Those are the kinds of waves that we're most interested in when we're thinking of sounds that have a pitch. And those kinds of waves are created when some kind of instrument or your voice somehow shakes back and forth repetitively. So that will create a series of compressions, one after the other. So I think one of the easy kind of instruments to think about for repetitive shaking is a drum, right? So what we want to do is if we're going to create a repetitive series of compressions, the face of the drum is going to move out and squish the air, and then it'll slosh back and suck back on the air. It'll squish out and, and uh, compress the air again. And so the net result you get in that case is this sort of periodic, repetitive set of compressions. So I can show you a little clip of that happening. Okay, so there's a tuning fork, one of my favorite instruments, and you can see that every time one of the prongs of the fork moves, it creates one of these compressions, and then the compressions move out, again in our case for the room, about 343 meters per second is how fast they move. Okay? <coughs> so. You should keep in mind, we've been talking about compressions because we're imagining squishing the air. Because we have a finite amount of air to work with, if we squish this and make it extra dense, then there's going to be less left over at the edges. So what we actually end up with with these periodic waves is a series of compressions and then what I'm going to call rarefactions. So areas where the air is extra dense, separated by areas where there's not as much air as usual, high density and low density. Okay, so to describe one of these repetitive or periodic waves, there's a couple of ways to think about it. Probably the most straightforward way to think about it and the way that connects most immediately to music is to think about how many of these compressions come to you each second. Okay, so if the tuning fork is shaking back and forth, let's say, a hundred times every second. It's going to create a hundred of those compressions every second, and they're going to all fly over to your ears. So they'll shake your eardrums a hundred times a second. So that number of compressions that come to you or are created by the instrument each second is called the frequency. It's just the number per second. And we measure that in hertz. 
because we like to name things after famous people who discover them. Okay, so that we measure them in hertz. So if I say something is oscillating at 100 hertz, it just means it sloshes back and forth 100 times a second. We also sometimes like to imagine, because we like to draw things, um, we like to imagine what the wave would look like in space if we could actually see it, like I've drawn it here. If we could actually see each of those compressions, take a photograph of them as they're on their way to you across the room, we like to think about how far apart two pieces of this wave might be. So if we imagine, say, the distance in space between those two adjacent compressions, we call that the wavelength. It's the length of the wave. If we have a wiggling wave, like I did on that machine over there, or like I might make on a string, we can make that same measurement, the distance between two crests, or if we like the distance between two of these low points, which would be like the distance between two rarefactions here, the distance between any two matching points on the wave is called the wavelength. Okay? So we have two descriptions for these periodic waves. The frequency, that tells us how many of them we get each second, and the wavelength, which tells us how far apart they are. Okay, and if you think about it, you'll realize that those two things, how close they are in space and how quickly they come in time, they kind of have to be related to each other, right? Because if I'm making lots and lots of wiggle, let's say I make a wiggle and then right away I make another one of them, right? And they're moving towards you, I make one, it starts coming at you, I make another one. So they're pretty close together in space, right? Right away I make the next one, right away I make the next one. So each one doesn't get to go very far before the next one is produced. So high frequencies always make short wavelengths. If it comes often, it'll look squished up like that. If I make one and then I wait a while, so it's had a long, the first one goes a long way, and then the next one comes, they're gonna be pretty far apart. So low frequencies make these large wavelengths. And we can relate them mathematically if we're in the mood to do such a thing. We don't absolutely have to, but you know, once in a while. Um, so these two things are actually related by the speed of the wave. Okay, so you, the speed is actually just found by multiplying the wavelength times the frequency. And remember, the speed is something that's set by the stuff itself. So here, the speed is set by the weight of these guys and the stiffness of this coupling. So whatever kind of wave I create here, it's going to make its way up and down at the very same speed. So one question we could ask is, what sorts of frequencies of sound waves are we actually able to hear? I mean, we could shake the air back and forth one times a second, or 10 times a second, or a million times a second. Not all of those things actually represent sounds that we can hear with our auditory system. Although our auditory system is actually pretty flexible. So we can hear sounds, uh, perceive sounds with our ears, that shake the air somewhere between 20 hertz, so 20 sloshes per second, that's the lowest note you can hear, and 20,000 sloshes per second is the highest note you can hear. Okay, so that's a pretty good range. As you probably know, dogs can go up much higher than this. Actually, if you slosh the air slower than this, slower than 20 times per second, if it's sloshing enough, you actually will perceive it. But you feel it more like a shaking or a vibration. Or if it's loud, you might just hear it as a series of clicks or bangs rather than an actual sound with a musical pitch. So if we use our rule that speed tells us the relationship between wavelength and frequency, we can figure out not just <coughs> uh, how fast the sounds are going that we hear, but also how big the waves are as they're coming to us, okay? So those high frequency sounds where the air is sloshing back and forth really fast, 20,000 times a second, those waves are about 17 centimeters long coming at you. So here's a compression and there's the next compression. Those, the much slower waves that we hear down here at 20 hertz, those represent much bigger wavelengths. So there's a compression and then 17 meters away, you know, like 50 feet or something away, is the next compression. So those are coming at you still 343 meters per second, but the crests are really far apart. Okay? So that gives you a sense of what our ears can do for us. All right, 
So I said that for musical sound, we're interested in these periodic, repetitive waves. So it seems fair to ask at this point, what does the frequency, that is the number of sloshes per second, have to do with the sound that we hear? Okay, and to understand that, it's probably best to just try it. I'll play you some sounds, and what I want you to do is listen to the sound, think about the pitch of the sound, and also watch the wave here. Okay, this is time along the bottom, so if the waves are squished up together, that means they're high frequency, they're coming often, and if the waves are stretched out apart, that means they're low frequency. They're coming less often at, to the microphone. All right, so let's make this sound. So we'll start again at low frequency. So that's a 140 hertz tone. You can see that the waves are nicely spread out. And now I'm going to increase the frequency, which means increasing the number of waves coming by each second. represented by the waves that are more closely spaced together, and again, we've gotten up to a much higher pitch. So what you'll notice is that as I turn down the frequency, the waves stretch out here, and the note goes down. So the way we describe the pitch of the note is high for high frequency, low for low frequency. Okay, so we've definitely figured something out here, right? We've figured out that the frequency of the sound wave, the number of times it shakes per second, is what determines our perception of the pitch. So high pitch is high frequency. Okay, so we can do more than that with pitch. Um, we can also think about how the frequency corresponds to the way that we commonly describe pitches. So musically, one of the most frequent intervals we talk about is the octave, right? So here's an octave. Right? And a musical octave corresponds to a doubling of the frequency. So if I start with 200 hertz and then I play 400 hertz, you'll hear those an octave apart. Or 800 and 1600, those are an octave apart. This shows you here the ranges of frequency for a lot of common instruments. So this goes down here from 10 hertz, which is just below what we can hear, up to 10,000 hertz. Remember, we can hear up to 20,000. You'll notice that, that the musical range that we use to play music actually consumes a good fraction of what we're possibly able to perceive. So we can hear from, ten, uh, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and we, we use, even just with the piano, most of that range. The piano goes from 27 hertz up to about 4,000 for the top note. Okay, the human voice, this includes sopranos, altos, tenors, basses, you name it. The human voice kind of runs from 100 about up to 1,000. Here's the tuba that my son plays and the piccolo that no one in my household has attempted. Okay, so that gives you kind of a sense of the range that we have. Okay, and this is to show you again how frequency of the sound wave corresponds to the pitch that we hear. This is a low C on the piano, 262 hertz. Here's the octave above at 524, and you can see that's doubling like it should be. Okay, another common interval that we're used to musically is the musical fifth. So say from C to G, right? And that actually is also a simple interval. Here's the C, 262. Here's the G, 392. If you stare at that for a moment, you'll see that that G is one and a half times the frequency of the C. Okay, so you take a frequency, you multiply it by one and a half, you get the note that's a musical fifth above. And if you multiply it by two, you get the octave. Here, right here at 440, 
is the A that the orchestra tunes to, right? So you may have heard people say, oh, we want A440, right? 440 is describing the number of oscillations per second. So this is the A, the open A string on the violin. Okay, so we said that, um, that, that how often the air is shaken by the instrument determines the uh, frequency of the sound wave, and the frequency of the sound wave determines the pitch, the musical pitch that we hear. So it seems like the honest questions to ask at this point would be, what determines the frequency at which the instrument itself shakes, right? Because we know if the instrument shakes, it'll shake the air, that's all set. But what determines how fast the instrument will shake back and forth? Okay, so to think about that, I've brought actually my most ancient shaking thing. So this is a pendulum. Um, Galileo loved these, and he thought about them by thinking about clocks. So pendula, heavy objects hanging from a string like this, always shake back and forth the same number of times each second, so long as you choose the same string and the same mass. So let's see if I can get it going. All right, you are getting very sleepy. Okay, so there's a pendulum shaking back and forth, and this has a frequency, right? It naturally goes back and forth all by itself a certain number of times a second, and I could make it start any day of the week, and it would always go back and forth the same number of times a second. Actually, everything has natural shaking frequencies like that. We call them resonances. So resonant frequencies are the natural vibration frequencies of an instrument or any object, okay? And there's a couple of ways to think about these resonant frequencies. We can think about them by thinking about if we smack or hit or bow or blow the object, what uh, rate will it shake back and forth? An easy way to actually figure out the answer to that question is not to hit it just once, but to actually take an object, we're gonna do this with this pink string, take an object and shake it back and forth um, at different rates. So we can try shaking it a couple times a second, or we can try shaking it 100 times a second. In general, if we just shake it randomly, it won't move very much, it'll just kinda go not much will happen, okay? But if we hit one of its resonant frequencies, one of the frequencies at which it would most like to shake back and forth, Suddenly, even though we're not shaking any harder, we'll get much more motion. So I'm going to show you that now. So what I've got in the front here is a shaker and the ability to change the number of times per second that that shaker wiggles the string back and forth. So let's just give this a try. Okay, so right now I'm shaking this string back and forth 22 times per second. And even though I love physics, I would claim that this is not exciting, right? Nothing is happening here that a person could conceivably care about. So what I'm gonna do now is try to pick some other frequencies to shake this string. I'm gonna increase very slowly the number of times per second I'm shaking here, but I'm not gonna shake any harder, just faster, okay? Ah. Okay. So I think you can see there that as I got up to a higher frequency, this is about 40 shakes per second, 40 hertz, suddenly I get this very much bigger and very distinct sort of arc-shaped motion. Do you guys see it here? So the string's actually going from curved up to curved down and back about 40 times a second. So I hit one of the resonances of this system. So this guy would like to shake 40 times a second. And you might think that we're done, but we're not. I do say that to my real students in class all the time, too. Okay, so, so let's just keep going. I'm going to increase the frequency a little more. Now I'm up around 45 times a second. 45 times per second is not special to this string, right? It's not doing anything exciting. But I'm going to keep going. That's, you can hear it humming. That's about 60 times a second. And when I get up there, ah, about 80. Interestingly, about twice the frequency, so 40 was special to this string, and now you can see here 80 is also special to this string. It's giving me a different motion, right? This one is stationary in the middle and has two big motions on either side. Okay, it's a different motion, but it's another resonance, okay? So this string, actually like all extended objects, has multiple resonant frequencies, not like the pendulum, but just has one 
number of times per second it'd like to slash back and forth. This one has a couple choices. 40 is good, 80 is good. Might even be able to get more. Okay, that's 120, mysteriously, three times 40. That one's good too. Right now I've got two stationary spots and three bumps. And you can imagine that if we all had a lot of patience, we could just keep going here, right? We'd get more and more and more. There are as many different resonant frequencies of this string as you would like, and they all seem to be separated by 40 hertz. Zero, 40, 80, 120. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what we've got for the resonant frequencies of a string. And what we want to understand now is what, yeah, so, so we want to understand now what physical properties of an object, and we'll start with this string, what physical properties of the string determine the resonant frequency. So what is it about this string that made it choose 40 and 80 and 120? I'll give you a hint, it's not because it's pink, although that would also be cool. Okay, so we want to think about that. Um, so to think about that, we should start thinking about what happens when we shape a string. So when we shape the string, it's just like when I shape this, right? So we create some disturbance, and it goes up to the end, and it bounces off the end, and it comes back, and in general, you can see that that makes a mess, right? There's all sorts of things jiggling. There's no pretty pattern. It's just some kind of crazy mess, right? And that's what happens here. If I just shake randomly, there's waves bouncing back and forth, and they're crashing into each other, and nothing <laughs> very big happens. But if I shake back and forth at just exactly the right number of shakes per second, What's going to happen is those bouncing waves will collide with one another, and in particular places they'll add up to something big, so every bouncing wave adds up with every other one, and in other places, as you saw, they'll add up to nothing, to no motion. So we can think about the resonant motions of a string by thinking about those, those special situations that give us what we call nodes and antinodes. So a node is a place that doesn't move at all. We had some of those. And an antinode is a place that moves a whole lot back and forth. And we can describe the particular resonances of our string by thinking about different ways that we can have a node at each end, because the string is tied down here. It definitely can't be moving back and forth in this spot. And then various ways to arrange the antinode. So here I've just got one antinode in the middle. And then you guys saw the second motion where I've got antinodes here and here, nodes at the end, and one that evenly divides halfway along. The next one has the nodes one third and two thirds of the way. Here I've got a quarter, two quarters, three quarters. Here I've got a fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths. You know, it's all about those fractions, right? <laughs> so what we have for the resonances of the string are these motions where we've got a node at each end, and then the other nodes dividing the string evenly along its length. So the question we want to think about now is what physical properties of this string determine its resonant frequencies, the particular number of shakes per second that this string likes to undergo. And to think about that, we'll start by thinking about the simplest motion that I've drawn at the top right here. The motion where the middle of the string goes up and down a lot, it's an antinode, and the ends are the only two places that don't move at all. We call this motion sometimes the fundamental mode or the first resonance of the string. So it's, this is the one that we had at the lowest frequency, which in this case was 40 hertz. Okay, so this is our fundamental. So how are we going to figure out what determines the frequency? So let's first think about the picture, right? So if we've got a picture here, we know that a picture can tell us about wavelength, right? The distance between two identical pieces of the wave. So let's think about this wave. This wave goes up and it comes down, but if it really wanted to be a whole wave, one of those waves that goes up and then down and then back up again, this isn't a whole wave, right? This is just a half. Really, it would like to keep going down, and then back up again. 
right? So we can make a relationship here. The length of the string from here to here is one half a wavelength, right? Because a whole wavelength would be all the way out over there. Okay, so the wavelength would be two times the length of the string. And we also know that what we care about from a pitch point of view is the frequency. Okay, frequency, the number of sloshes per second is going to tell us the pitch. And we decided before that that had to do with the speed and the wavelength. So to get the frequency that this string likes to vibrate at in its fundamental mode, we take the speed with which waves run along the string and divide by the wavelength, which is twice the length. Okay, so that tells us something. So the frequency, this frequency of oscillation has to do with the speed and the length of the string. So we can think about what would change the fundamental frequency of a string, or if we want to think a little bit musically, when we imagine maybe this is a violin string or a guitar string, we think about what is going to actually, let's say, increase the pitch of the note that this string would play when you pluck it. Okay? So if we want to increase the pitch, we want to increase the frequency. And if we want to increase the frequency, we need to either increase the speed or decrease the length. So let's think about those two things separately. So you probably know that on a violin or on a guitar, if you want to go for a higher note, you put your finger down partway along the string, right? So when you pluck it or you bow it, only a piece of it is sloshing back and forth, and that makes a higher note. It makes a higher note because it makes a higher fundamental resonant frequency or lowest resonant frequency. But you know, if you did only that, life would be kind of hard, right? Because on a piano, for example, you have to be able to cover notes from about 27 hertz all the way up to 4,000 hertz, right? So that's a large range of frequencies. If you try to do that just by having all the strings for the different notes just be different lengths, you would need the longest strings to be about 300 times the length of the smallest strings. So there'd be strings in there that were one centimeter long and strings in the piano that were three meters long, which would be inconvenient, right? Three meters is, you know, whatever, 18 feet, okay? So that doesn't fit. So what do they actually do in a piano? What's the difference between the low notes and the high notes? It is true that the strings are shorter for the high notes, but they're also skinnier, right? So if you look in there, there are those big, thick, heavy strings that are playing the low notes and little skinny light strings that are playing the high notes. Why does the mass make a difference? Well, you know that, because the mass tells us something about how fast a disturbance can propagate. Remember I said if we made these all really heavy, the wave would go up more slowly. So we're, if we make things heavy, we decrease the velocity, Decreasing the velocity decreases the frequency. Okay, so we can change the pitch a string would play by making the string shorter. We could make the string lighter. That would make the, the uh, pitch go higher. And then the final thing we could do, the final thing that goes into this velocity, remember, is the coupling between adjacent pieces, how much they talk to each other. And in a string, you make them talk to each other more strongly by pulling that string tighter so that when you pull this piece, it exerts a bigger force on the piece next to it. And you know that too, so if you're tuning a violin and you wanted to make it higher, you tighten that string, you pull on it harder. Pulling on it harder increases the tension, that increases the velocity, that increases the frequency. Okay, so the mass, the tension, and the length all matter for the tuning of a string. Okay, so that's all about strings. Now I said I might be a little biased and mostly talk about strings, but it turns out that even to talk about stringed instruments, we need to think about resonances of other kinds of objects. So, as you know, a violin isn't just made up of a string, right? It's a string tied to some complicated, expensive piece of wood, right? And the expensive piece of wood matters and that's because every part of the violin, including the front and back pieces of wood, has resonances, just like a string has resonances. So what I've got for you here is a piece of metal, just a metal plate, with sand sprinkled over it. 
I'm going to do the exact same exercise on this metal plate that I did on the pink string. So I've got the same machine for shaking it up and down, and I'm going to try shaking it up and down at different frequencies and see if I can find the resonances, and also see if I can look and see where the nodes, the places of no motion, and the antinodes are. That's why it looks like it's sprinkled with salt. That's actually sand. I have a sand shaker. Okay, and the idea is the sand will bounce up and down if the plate is bouncing up and down, and it'll sit still where the nodes of no motion are. Okay, so let's try it. You can see the sand beginning to move. And piling up. piling up to make a particular pattern on the plate. Let's try some other frequencies. There's a new pattern, another resonance at 4,444 hertz with a different arrangement of nodes, these solid lines, and anti-nodes, places where the sand has been shaken away. Let's keep going up. And yet another pattern appears. In fact, just like the string, this plate has essentially an infinite series of different possible resonant frequencies. And you can see that the patterns are much more complicated in two dimensions, right? In the one-dimensional string, basically all you had to do was place the nodes some even integer number of times along the string. So you could have one node, you could have two nodes, you could have three nodes or four, right? So here, they're spread out in these complicated and I think rather beautiful patterns. And actually people do exactly this experiment with the back plate of the violin and you can see all the different ways that the violin likes to shake at its particular resonances. Okay, so we found out then that our string has a series of resonant frequencies, particular frequencies at which it would most like to shake. And each of those resonances is associated with a particular shape of motion of the string. We can describe the shape of the motion of the string if we like in terms of the wavelength of the wave that's created. So our fundamental has the longest wavelength, twice the string length. Our next mode, which we sometimes call the second resonance, or you'll see hear people call this the second harmonic, um, or the second frequency um, of this string, you can see it's a shorter wave, right? In fact, it's a wave that's exactly half the wavelength of the one above. So this one gets half a wavelength from here to here. This one gets half a wavelength from there just to the middle of the string. Right? So if the wavelength of this is twice the length of the string, the wavelength for this second resonance <coughs> is exactly the length of the string. There's a whole wave. For the third resonance, we can see a whole wave just to there. So the wavelength is not even quite a whole string length. In fact, it's two-thirds of the length of the string. For the next mode, I didn't show you guys this one, but you could guess what it looks like. For the next mode, the wavelength is exactly half the string length and then two-fifths of the string length. In fact, you can guess from here what the wavelengths of all of the resonance are. So I've got 2L over 1, 2L over 2, 2L over 3, 2L over 4, 2L over 5, 2L over 6, 2L over 7, 2L over a million and six, right? Okay, so I've got this whole series of wavelengths, and from that series of wavelengths, these spatial patterns, I can figure out what all the frequencies are, what all the pitches are that the, of the notes that this string would play if it were shaking in one of these particular resonances. Right, so how do I do that? I remember that to find a frequency, I take the speed, divide by the wavelength. So that's all I've done here, so V over 2L, Here's V over this wavelength, 2L over 2. Here's V over this wavelength, 2L over 3. And what you'll notice here is that the frequencies of the vibrations for these particular resonances are related to each other in a beautiful and simple way. In fact, all of these resonant frequencies are just multiples of the lowest one. So if I have a string that wants to shake up and down, the lowest frequency it likes to shake up and down at, let's say, is 40 hertz, that's this one, then we know that the next mode will be at 80 hertz, 
and the next one at 120, and then the next one uh, uh, 4 to the 40, 160, right? And then 200 hertz, right? So as soon as you know this frequency, you know the frequencies of all of these harmonics, and this is a series of multiples of exactly whatever it is that your fundamental frequency is going to be. Okay, so we've made a lot of progress, right? We figured out what sound waves are, we figured out what frequency means, we know the frequency tells us about pitch, and we know what physical properties of the string determine its frequency and therefore determine its pitch. But I claim that I have not told you anything deep, because we have two problems that we haven't dealt with at all, and I think that they're both kind of important. First of all, when we talked about figuring out how to raise or lower the pitch you hear when you pluck a string, we only talked about this lowest resonant frequency, right? But there's all these other ones. How come they don't tell us what note we get when we pluck the string? How come we only got to think about this one when I said that the string was happy to vibrate in any of these kinds of motions? So that's one question. And the other question is, what about different instruments, right? If I have a violin and a piano playing the same note, like exactly the same pitch, you can tell which one is which, right? You can tell this is a violin, this is a piano, and this is a trumpet, and you would never get confused. Even though they're paying the same frequency, the same pitch, there's something about the tone quality, we sometimes call the timbre of the sound, that is different from instrument to instrument. So it turns out that these two ways that I have let you down by not telling you about how to deal with these multiple resonances and by not telling you about different instruments, they go together. The answer to both of those questions is the same. And to think about what the answer is to what do we do with the multiple resonances and how do we figure out the timbre of an instrument that distinguishes one instrument from another, we need to look at the actual sound waves produced by real instruments. Oh, so there's violins. There's the back of a violin with its resonances made down the sand, and that's a tuba. Okay, so these are sound waves produced by real instruments, and they're all playing the same pitch, the same note. Okay, so this one is um, a soprano, this one is a piano, and this one is a factory whistle, all playing the same note. And again, what you're looking at here is one of these traces that shows you the way a microphone is moving in time. So this is the actual sound wave pushing on the microphone as it comes up to its surface. So this is reflecting the compressions and rarefactions of the air created by each of these instruments, the soprano, the piano, and the factory whistle, with whom I'm sure the soprano would rather not be compared. Okay, so that's what we've got. Why do I say these are the same frequency? So to figure out whether they're the same frequency, you want to actually look at the whole shape of the wave, this complicated wave, and see how many times the whole wave repeats. So here I've got one, two, three of the whole complicated shape. Here I've got three of that shape, and here I've got three of this shape. So the overall frequency, the overall number of waves um, per second is the same. Okay? But the shape is completely different. Right? The shape of each one of these individual cycles is completely different between these three instruments. So how do we actually get complicated waves like this from the resonances of an instrument? Here's how to think about it. Let's go back to our string because we understand our string. If the string is just shaking back and forth, in one of its resonant motions, say just in the fundamental, it will make a very simple sound wave. Just this one. No extra wiggles, no bumps, no elephant shapes, just this simple wave, okay? And similarly, if it's oscillating in any of these pure uh, resonant motions, you'll also get a very simple sound wave. They're very simple sound waves with different frequencies, so this is three cycles, this one's six cycles, that one's nine cycles in the same amount of time, but they're all just simple oscillations. None of them have the complexity that the voice or the piano or the whistle produces. However, I can make a complex wave like that by adding them together. So this red wave I have on the bottom, which begins to look like the sound produced by a real instrument, 
It's got some overall repetition time, and then it's got a bunch of extra funky wiggles that make it some interesting shape. That wave came just by adding up these three. And that kind of tells us what's going on inside a real instrument when it's shaking the air. It's not just vibrating in one of these particular resonant motions, it's vibrating in some combination of them. So in this case, it's looking like I'm getting some, if, if this is the wave that comes out, it means I'm getting some motion like this, added to some motion like that, and then also some motion in the third harmonic. Okay, so that's what we've got in real instruments. And to kind of try to convince you how that works, I've got a couple of little sound clips that we can try. Um, so this is uh, the note from a clarinet, followed by the pieces of that note taken apart that correspond to the individual resonant motions of the clarinet. So first you'll hear a clarinet, and then you'll hear a series of tones which correspond to the individual resonance motions for, for the clarinet tube. fundamental tone, which is, you associate with the pitch that you hear, and they're all packed in to the note that the clarinet makes, and they help us recognize the timbre of that note as definitely being clarinet. One of the things you'll notice about this complicated wave that's created by adding up these three simple waves is that it's overall frequency, the total number of bumps I get here in this amount of time is the same as the fundamental. I've got three of these complicated wave shapes. I've got three of those simple fundamental ones. So when you take the fundamental and you add in motions from the higher resonances, you still get a note that sounds like it has the frequency of the fundamental. It has the pitch that's set by that lowest resonant motion. That's why it was okay for me to talk about changing the pitch of the violin by thinking about what frequency we get just for that simplest fundamental motion. But then to figure out the shape of the wave, which allows us to distinguish between sounds made by different instruments, we need to think about how the motions from the other harmonics are mixed in. So again, there are our three instruments, piano, soprano, and whistle. And one way we try to represent the contributions of the motion um, at different frequencies or uh, with different harmonics is with one of these spectra. So what this is, is just telling us how much motion I have at the fundamental and how much in the second harmonic and the third and the fourth and the fifth. So this is showing us that most of this motion is fundamental. I've got a little bit of second harmonic and then much less motion at the higher resonant frequencies. The soprano does something different. The soprano has a lot in the fundamental, but also quite a fair fraction in the second and the third, and then it dies off. And in the next lecture, we'll talk more about the details of forming the voice. And the whistle is funny, right? The whistle doesn't have the most at the fundamental. It actually has the most in the sixth harmonic there. So the majority of the motion for that whistle is at that very high harmonic. But because there's still some of the fundamental, we still hear it as the same notes as those two other instruments. OK, so the last thing I wanted to show you having to do with this question of timbre is not taking apart a note like we just did with the clarinet but actually putting a note together, starting by playing just the tone of the fundamental and then adding in the next harmonic and the next harmonic and the next harmonic. And what I want you to notice is how many harmonics we have to add in before the note starts to sound like an instrument that you actually recognize. When you first just hear one uh, vibration just from the fundamental, it won't sound like a real instrument, but eventually it does start to sound like one. And we're gonna have two different instruments and you can see what you can hear. Effective spectrum on tandem. You will hear the sounds of two instruments built up by adding partials one at a time.
That was a bell. That one was a guitar, which you probably figured out along the way. So, one last thing about these harmonics. You might have noticed as you were listening to the bell or the clarinet tone being constructed from the harmonic vibrations, that the individual harmonics seem to have some sort of musical relationship to one another. And that's very true. That has to do with the fact that the vibrations of our string here are made up of frequencies that are all simple integer multiples of the lowest fundamental frequency. And that simple integers also have to do with musical intervals, right? So if I play the fundamental, this lowest one, and then <laughs> the second harmonic, the next one above, I double the frequency. And as you guys know, doubling the frequency is the same as changing the note by an octave, right? Right, that's doubling the frequency. And that's also the interval between those two harmonics. And if I go up another one, I go from twice the frequency to three times the frequency. So the interval between those two is three to two. That's one and a half. And we said that one and a half is a musical fifth. So going from here to here, Okay, that's what you're doing in going from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth, this one to this one, <coughs> you're going from three frequencies to four, so that's a ratio of four to three, that's a musical fourth. So if I go from the fundamental to the second harmonic, to the third harmonic, to the fourth harmonic, I'm following that sequence, and then I run out of little piano, so I can't keep playing, but in fact, um, the sequence of harmonics gives us <laughs> mostly notes that really are on the musical scale and that correspond to chords that we're very used to. So these are the harmonics of a string that in its fundamental plays the C two octaves below middle C on the piano. That's that really low C if you don't read the bass clef. Here's the next harmonic, one octave up. Here's the third harmonic, up a fifth. The fourth harmonic, up another four, so I've got two octaves from the fundamental to the fourth harmonic. And everything keeps going along just fine until I get up to the seventh harmonic here. You see how that note is drawn in color? The note is drawn in color because of this number minus 31 on the top. That uh, note right there sounds flat to us. It sounds actually a third of a semitone flat if you were actually just trying to play notes on the scale. And that proves to be a problem in pianos that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. But basically, the harmonics of the string and the notes of the scale go together. So the final thing I wanted to mention is that not every object has resonances that simply give us integer multiples of the same frequency. So <coughs> you know that there are instruments in the world that definitely play a tone, like a flute, right? And it can play a whole scale. And there are instruments in the world that kind of more just make a percussive sound with less of a pitch associated with it, like a drum, right? I can tune a drum, but you still get a lot of thump along with the note. Why is that? So that has to do with the fact that for a two-dimensional object like a drum, as we saw with our demonstration, you still have resonances, but they're much more complicated than the resonances of a string. So here I have the lowest motion is just the whole drum head sloshing out and then sloshing in and then sloshing out. That's the fundamental. The next one 
The next one is one part sloshing forward and the other part sloshing backwards with the middle being a node. So the middle doesn't move. And that's not twice the frequency, it's 1.59 times the frequency. And then you get one where the quarters are moving and that's a 2.14 times the frequency, then 2.3 times the fundamental and 2.9 times the fundamental. So these are perfectly honest um, motions. There's a nice motion for one of them, you can see. Nice resonances. Here's another one. Okay, nice resonant motions. Nothing wrong with them, but they're not in this harmonic series that gives you the frequency, twice the frequency, three times the frequency. And what happens then is when you add up the waves from all of these motions, they don't make something that repeats evenly at exactly the fundamental. They make some complicated wave, but it doesn't always repeat exactly the same way the fundamental does. And so what we get from these kind of anharmonic instruments is more of a thud, more of a noise, with less pitch associated with it. And there's a whole continuum between instruments that basically have perfectly harmonic uh, resonances, where it's always a frequency, two times the frequency, three times the frequency, and then two instruments where the resonant frequencies are really kind of randomly related to each other, which tends to sound less like a pitch and more like a percussive hit. And then there are things in between, like the bell we heard, right? Think about the bell we heard building up the, the tone. It definitely had a note, but there was also kind of a clanging sound to it, right? That's how you identify a bell. So it's sort of halfway between just having a pitch and having something more percussive. And you can see the way that works by comparing sort of the series of, of, of harmonics created by the guitar and by the bell. So if they both have a fundamental at 250, the guitar just has twice that, three times that, four times that, to make a periodic wave that matches the fundamental that we hear as this pitch. The bell, though, starting at 250, even the one that's supposed to be twice it isn't quite tuned. And when you get up higher, it's really completely missing what should be the even multiples of that lowest frequency. So probably you heard that bell seemed clangier and clangier as we put the higher frequencies into it. And that's because it has some relationship between the low and the higher resonant frequencies, but not a perfect integer relationship. So I just want to end the lecture by showing you my favorite instrument, uh, other than the violin, which is partly harmonic like this and partly clanky, which are the tuned sticks. So I'll play you this scale and then I'll stop. Okay, so it was sort of an octave from here to here, right? But it's mostly clattery, okay? And we're still tuning the length to get low notes versus high notes, just like we do on a violin or a cello, but we have non-harmonic resonances that give us lots of other sounds as well. So thank you for listening to this first lecture, Introducing the Physics of Sound Waves. In the next lecture, we'll talk about particular instruments and how the construction of those instruments influences the particular sounds they create. Thank you.